Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we are in the Committee of the Whole Meeting of April 17th. Health and Squall, increased to Lakhtamak, Klaas, Bahamish, Oweomayok. Welcome to the traditional territory of the Squamish Nation. There's an agenda in front of the committee looking for a motion to adopt the agenda. Moved by Councillor Pryor, seconded by Councillor Black Wolf. All those in favor? Opposed, motion carries. Um, so, first up, we have the zoning bylaw update priorities discussion. And this is sort of dovetailed with the council priorities discussion because I think of the council priorities digging into the uh, things we'd like to see done within the zoning bylaw prior to the end of this term was a conversation that the council wanted to have. So, just with that in mind. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so I'm just going to introduce it. Um, Matt uh, Gunn, the planner, is going to talk in more detail, uh, but essentially on the agenda is a list of components that uh, would have to be included uh, in staff's opinion in the zoning bylaw update. And council, I think, at the last meeting wanted to see it, uh, to see if there was anything that could be uh, prioritized to be done prior to the end of the term. And I'll pass on to Yeah, and just um, for Council's uh, knowledge, um, staff regularly is compiling um, items that we believe uh, would be beneficial to, to update as we go through applications and processes and find issues. And there, the zoning bylaw is complex. There's many of these. Um, we've been envisioning the update to the zoning bylaw following the OCP as a fairly major endeavor. Uh, and so we, we would love to address all of the problems of the zoning bylaw that we've identified. Um, so this list that you have in front of you is, is a synopsis of all of those issues. Um, some of them are fairly straightforward. Some of them are more complicated and require a fair level of um, consideration and uh, probably engagement with the community to, to identify the, the proper path moving forward. Um, and recognizing that there are some council interests in um, tackling some issues sooner rather than later. Um, we've brought this forward with the intention of um, identifying or having council identify if there are issues that they would like to be carved off and addressed first with the larger bulk of work being done later. And I think the reason is because given the, the number of items and the complexity of some of these items, um, the timelines to, to complete the complete overhaul are going to be longer than um, our likely possible in the remaining uh, term that we have uh, with council at this time. What timeline were you thinking about the, if, if we weren't worried about getting stuff done before October, September, what timelines were you looking at for the rewriting of the I think, um, I think our general estimate would be mid-2019 for finishing. So a year from now? A year, yeah. yeah. It's quite a long list as you can see. Um, and some of it will, would require public engagement, so that also always adds a good chunk of time. And that, that's a long time to do, as, to sort of accumulate things that need to be changed, so it, maybe we'll have that conversation at the end of the day. So keep going. Um, yeah, and we haven't prepared a presentation for today, okay. um, but uh, what we did do is um, staff have taken the, the list of items We've tried to identify what staff see as some of the higher priority items, um, and that might uh, might be useful for council's consideration of if there are items that they want to move forward uh, sooner rather than later. Um, but with, with these items, and what we don't have here yet is a, a real analysis of how long each of these items will take, and um, these items vary in how engaged the public may be in response to proposed changes. Um, some of them may generate a high level of engagement and concern and consideration, and some of them will have a much lower level of concern and consideration. And that's probably, um, if, we, if we discuss some of these items and, and identify some that council are interested in potentially ad uh, addressing earlier, um, we might be able to talk a little bit about that level of engagement these generate, which can um, affect the likelihood of being able to address them within the you know the coming six months. So did you want to go over these? Just go over these? Sure. Hi. Um, maybe the high rather than moderates and lows. Um, okay, so alignment with OCP. Um, there's a number of uh, there's a number of issues that are contained within this this piece itself. Um, 
we have we have historical zoning that doesn't relate doesn't reflect the intended land uses that the OCP has identified, and so one of the possibilities is that we could make changes to zoning to go in and change zoning to reflect OCP land use designations. Um, there's also uh, some some interest or some discussion at the staff level regarding changes to zoning to reflect um, the future residential neighborhood use um, or zones that we see res becoming residential within the community but probably aren't appropriate to do at this time. And in those, with those zones, there's some talk around whether we would want to use uh, some kind of holding zone um, or if we'd want to consider uh, a lower density zone with some kind of density bonusing option. Um, that becomes much more complex to, to try and address at this time. But uh, th that's one option. And then there are some uh, zone, there's some zoning that um, reflects uh, development opportunities right now where we are interested in potentially doing sub area planning um, that is identified in the OCP. Uh, and there's a, there is an interest in contemplating how we might be able to address the need for sub area planning for these areas uh, given that they have existing zoning. And so, so some of these issues are going to be quite challenging to deal with. Um, and there could be a high level of public engagement on some of these. Um, and we haven't spent the time, we've just haven't come close to the end of the OCP process. We haven't delved deep into this issue to identify all the properties and what the process would be, but it is a, a one fairly significant project. Do you have a specific, it was all kind of ambiguous. Do you it have is, a specific um, thing? Yeah. Pull up the map. Um, Let's suppose that you're writing a really important email to a colleague. Good to know what you're editing up on YouTube there. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, so... That would be worse. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why. I don't want to know what Ted So, okay, so some of them, and some and of these- so you're not talking master plans. Master plans. No. no, you're talking- No, um, and they, to be honest, we haven't delved into all the properties yet. We've just actually started GIS analysis to, to do, you know, here's all of the land use designations that we have. Here are the zones that are currently encompassed in those land use designations, and here are where they, they don't match. Um, and some of them relate to zones that we don't have yet. So for example, um, we need to develop new zones for conservation lands, um, marine conservation, marine mixed use, marina, yes, marine here, yeah. yeah, transportation infrastructure, agriculture, watershed, wellhead protection. So we need to create some new zones. Then we'd want to um, rezone properties to, to match those zones, and those zones reflect the land use designations. So that's one suite of those items. Um, with the sub area planning, and I don't know if we want to talk about. Okay. Yeah, there are a number of um, areas where the OCP and the zoning bylaw don't line up, and the zoning bylaw would actually allow for development. And so, if we don't move on aligning the two, then it's very likely that we'll see um, those properties developed in misalignment with the OCP. So, Finch area, like the Loggers, Loggers Lane, Finch, Robin Drive, you know, all those properties are zoned single family RS1. Um, um, and there's definitely interest uh, from the neighborhood there in developing it, uh, or from the landowners in developing it to that effect, um, where we think you know we really need a sub area plan um, to see what's the what is the optimal uh, neighborhood development. Um, and it's not the only area that is in that situation. The Crumpet, uh, the area around Crumpet, uh, is the same. It's zoned residential. Yeah, so here's an example. We have a, a pretty vast... So do you want to rezone those lands? Well, there's, we, we would like to be able to do um, some sub area planning there. And one of the questions we have is, you know, how are we going to incentivize doing sub area planning in this area? Because at current, it could come in as single family development applications through subdivision right now as it stands. Um, and so this question is there, is there an interest in looking for a strategy to try and um, find a, a, a way to incentivize doing some sub area planning. Yeah. 
but I'm trying to understand the misalignment with the OCP. The OCP says residential, is it not? Yeah, that, that one um, is alignment with policy in the OCP. So that's aligning with policies policy where we want to have specific. Yes, yeah, we want to have separate planning for that area. You've seen some preliminary subdivision applications in here for all single family. And if it comes in as AO, it, it, it gets approved with the zoning in place. That's the problem. And similarly on the RS1, if someone wants to do an RS1 subdivision, the zoning's in place. So I don't know that if that's what we want to do. Okay. Yeah, <clears throat> I remember when that one subdivision went in two acre lots there, probably the one that's got the little square on it, I'm not sure, but, uh, you know, a lot of the neighbors at the time when we had the public information meetings and that were opposing change to their neighborhood. One of my concerns was all of those streams going through there and potential agricultural land. And then, so that was kind of discarded a bit because you know, we had the application in front of us for six lots on a two acre one, I think six or eight. Then we met with the people that talked about the agricultural land reserves and they said to us, start trying to get your agricultural land back again. So I thought, well, I immediately thought of that area. And um, so I know there is a few people in that area that are looking at six houses per lot again. So uh, I do think that master plan for that area could have some different kind of connector trails, for example, to the rec center, protecting the habitat. But uh, it's hard to sell somebody they've had that land all the time, and then all of a sudden, oh, no, don't bring us anything for doing a master plan next year. Totally. And, and so th these are, this is a really challenging topic, to, to be honest. Um, it's essentially, um, yeah, we're trying to identify if there's a way that we could give ourselves a chance to, to address these in a, in a cohesive and thought out fashion um, and put some zoning in place that gives us that time to do that. And one option would be a holding zone, which is uh, which essentially would allow what's happening there now, um, but not any increase in density or activity until we come up with a severe plan. And it may, again, I think we've had this discussion before, it might facilitate some of those landowners uh, putting the funds together to do a sub area plan. So we are talking sub area planning? Yeah, for some, for some of them. Okay. Yeah, but not for all of them. Yes. Um, okay, so on the, this particular slide here, this part of the map, so, I mean, we have the rural and residential. So, I mean, if somebody comes to us, the RL1, if they come to us, they have to go through the resulting yes, that process, one sure. right? And then the RS1, um, I mean, would it be fair to say, though, that it's still quite a long ways off as far as, I mean, there's no water line up there, I don't think. I mean, everybody's running off wells in Finch area, are they not? And it's mostly up on the bench, too, out of the, just the big, big lot, yeah. It's getting, it's that. It's getting great service. Yeah, yeah, it is getting service right now. As part of the May course, there was a commitment to provide some service in India. We have seen a preliminary subdivision application for single family in this area. Oh, there's been one on the books for years. There's one there 10 years ago. And our, our growth management boundary, where where is that? It encompasses that, that area. It's in that area? Yeah. And then what about the Crumpton Woods one? It encompasses that area as The well. entire yeah. area? Yeah, not that entire RS1 zone it's a area. Future residential node, isn't it? No, that, that one, because of its zoning, um, it was encompassed and it was it's not future residential, it's residential neighborhood. But identified as a sub area planning area. It's identified area. as a sub area planning area. It was a, that's a complicated one because it has this existing zoning, but there but we do have this desire to, to do some planning in that area. Um, otherwise it could be a, a giant single family uh, neighborhood. And you know, we, we, could have ex we could have put it outside the growth management boundary, but it doesn't really make sense given that it has the zoning already. Yeah, I, I was just, Jason actually hit the point because 
Um, that one on Finch Drive, we had to rezone because it, uh, to subdivide it, uh, had to be rezoned. So we had a chance to make a decision, yes or no, on that. So that particular area, because of the rural ER-L zone, I think is probably safe subject to council decision. Some people can't just walk in for subdivision. Yeah, but there is RS1. It's the surrounding one. area. And so, and also the adjacent one that's adjacent to Crumpet Woods. And it's more a discussion, I think, of priorities on sub-area plans. Uh, and I would guess that that's probably one of the, considering that it isn't developed and it can be developed, um, if you compare that to, for example, the North Yards, which is pretty much already developed in some form, uh, maybe not the final form, um, you know, it might be that that's more important to capture that um, before you do get these things. And so why wouldn't we, as part of our growth management strategy, uh, just put a pause on, um, on new applications coming in for those properties and say, look, this is our timetable for a sub-area plan. Um, we're not going to do anything until that time. Separate from all the OCP discussions, just we've identified this as a priority area for a sub-area plan and we just don't want things kind of jumping ahead of that. Mm -hmm. Is there a problem with that? Doing that? Um, yeah, so I think that's in part, that is the thought of this, um, this alignment with the OCP to put a different zoning on there because at the moment, because it has the RS1 zoning, um, it's not a discretionary application that could come forward for these RS1 areas. They could just be subdivision applications. Um, so it is essentially looking for a strategy to, to put a pause on so that we can catch up with some of these elements. Um, and I just want, I do want to highlight that we've, we're, ident we're talking about two of the kind of lack of alignment um, between OCP policy and land use designations and zoning. Um, this item is intended to reflect uh, the need to spend some time doing some analysis across the whole community to find out where there are these gaps. Because so far we've been working hard to get our OCP in, done, but we haven't had the time to really go down to that zoning level and make sure that we know where all of the, the gaps are and if there are other issues like this around the community. Now, they're not going to be on the scale of some of the things we're just talking about, but there are probably some other areas of misalignment that we'd like to spend some time um, so that we know if there are other pieces we want to address. But just to follow up on that, if it's already zoned RS1 and we say we want to pause development in that area, can we pause subdivision? Because what we don't want, uh, or at least not without consideration, uh, is just a, a sprawl of RS1. Um, so that's the thing we want to stop until we can impose something else uh, in that area. Is that possible to do that? I don't, I don't think no. so. Not, no, I'm, the only way to do is for zoning. We'd have to downzone it yeah. or yes. zone it somehow. Yes. There are the tools that we do have are very temporary in nature. We've used the tools, you know, that give us 90 days before, but that really relates to building issuance, building mm -hmm. permits. Um, so this will take a little more time. Thanks. So I hear what Councillor Race is saying, but there that comes with all sorts of unintended consequences, huge consequences for property owners in the area that already have the RS1 zoning who only want to do RS1 zoning. It will prevent any additions to their houses. It will prevent laneway houses from going in because we won't be able to take in applications because what if that's not the intention? Whatever gets built now will be lasting an incredibly long time. It may not fit any neighborhood planning. And Matt, you put it really succinctly, is those, those miscommunications between our zoning and our OCP. We have our OCP which gives direction in a really solid way of where we want our neighborhoods to go. We have walkable commercial, preserving our green spaces. All just, of these, just reminder, sorry, I'm just reminder that we have the third reading of the OCP tonight, so yeah. don't go too far down the OCP conversation. Just, I just wanted to get a little question. Okay, I'm talking about our past yeah. OCP. Okay, good. <laughs> okay. sorry. But, uh, I'm sorry. I just didn't want you to go down the OCP. I just don't want to be interrupted. Uh, regardless of that, I totally agree about neighborhood plans. I wonder, you know, I think that if it's done properly and you bring the neighborhood in, it can't be us imposing, we want to do this to your neighborhood, do you like it or not? If you actually include the neighborhood and have a solid neighborhood plan and do it the w really well with inviting the public in to listen and then give the neighborhood what they want in their neighborhood and include values that we have. Uh, and that we want in other neighborhoods that have been implemented in other neighborhoods successfully. 
I don't know if we've done that yet. So I'm excited to have neighborhood <coughs> planning so that we can actually have maybe uh, that area of the employment zoning has been rezoned residential. Maybe we can actually put some employment zoning back in the area so that we can have walkable neighborhood there. Right now we're building car neighborhoods. We still have to define missing middle because if that's what you want in that area and you just want to pop up all sorts of different type of housing, it's going to be incredibly difficult to find value in a neighborhood plan when you're just dumping in more townhouses and residential. So you have to, like right now it's single family housing. There can be uh, uh, laneway houses, there can be increased density, there can be rental units. Um, flood construction level in this area is a big concern as well. So anything that changes has to include flood construction level because that whole area is a floodway. And uh, Brendan Park was brought in as well. So I wonder how that plays into that. So there's a lot of considerations and it seems like you have thought about most of these things and, and those ways that integrate, but I'm worried about pausing development or, I don't mind getting applications, it's only RS1 now. There's nothing wrong with getting an application, maybe it's something fantastic. Not even RS1, so yeah. Or, yeah, exactly. So so any of these only applications. I think when we're talking about law of it's RL1. RL1, sorry, it's... Make a point, sorry, I Oh, why not RS1, it's both. That's the, on the bench. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the back. Yeah. Do you want to respond to that, Gary? Yeah, the, the we're trying to create the space to be able to do that. <coughs> if you don't, you potentially risk just getting a single family subdivision and the application won't come to council. It just it will go through a subdivision process, it will get approved, and you won't get anything other than single family homes. That's the concern. That's not where we're where the OCP wants this neighborhood to go. If we don't give that space, that process room to breathe, room yeah. to breathe. What you'll get is what the current zoning allows potentially. That's the concern. Um, so uh, maybe a question to staff. Um, we're not going to answer all these no. today, but we want to get down to a list of yes, we want to prioritize this, 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 and have a bylaw back in front of council in September. Something like that. Yeah, so I could continue on. So I don't, I, yeah, I just wanted to give council an example of what you meant by this. Oh, totally. And it almost sounds like you mean a sub area plan. Um, a well, comprehensive sorry. approach to alignment with the OCP, and that's how you basically layer on a sub area plan. Uh, the alignment with the OCP would be um, just identifying places where, there, there are a couple things. One is identifying places where we have. Um, uh, zones that don't match the land use designations, and it may not be this issue, the other things, and looking at correcting those. Another item is trying to find places where, like this, we, we think the development may occur out, uh, beyond what we're looking for, and, and changing the zoning to pause so that we can do those um, separate plans. I have uh, Karen and Ted and Jason still on my list here, but I don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves in terms of we're not, we're not actually here to discuss these things, we're here to set the priorities to open that. Um, I guess my question was, uh, so that first one I thought in my mind sounds like it takes a longer time, requires engagement, and is a pretty thoughtful process. So then I went to the next one, which is the missing middle, and you say in there amending residential zones to encourage or mandate for greater variety of housing. So I wondered if actually that is a faster route to try and protect some of these areas while you do that, that longer term work, so that we, we just change RS1 zoning, so that you actually can't bring forward just single family lots. You have to include a greater variety of homes in an RS1 subdivision. And I wondered if that was just, uh, while still allowing for proposals, we are trying to protect some of that space and if that was a faster way to do it. Can I respond to that? Um, it, it may be, although to be honest, so this is really a preliminary list of issues we've identified and starting to think about what the solutions may be, but um, you know, I think with the missing middle, that's going to require a bunch of thought. We don't have an answer as to how we're going to incentivize or mandate that to occur in, in what are currently RS1 zones. And it may be that uh, the solution that comes out of that could address some of those issues of the alignment, but it, it may also not be. Like one of the possibilities is we may want to switch areas to a form-based code. When you read about missing middle, that's often one of the items that is suggested, but that's a major project to, to change from you know, our current zoning strategy to using form-based form code. We, it's always going to require outside expertise. 
um, not necessarily a simple process either. Um, so, yeah, th there's some questions to answer there um, that I don't know if, the, if that missing middle is going to address that uh, alignment with OCP piece, and certainly in, in the short term. Yeah, I think it would help. It might help. If I, if I may add to what Matt said, um, the other component of, of um, going with the, the first option is in some of these areas we might be looking for employment space as well. Um, so just because it's zoned residential doesn't mean that you know the the best use of the area from the community perspective is residential. There may be a mix a mixture of uses uh, in some of these areas, particularly in this one. Can I just ask a follow up? Um, is it possible to mandate in residential zones that people have to be within a fifteen minute walk of a commercial hub? I'm not sure. Probably not. No, you have to. That's ten, ten minutes. <laughs> ten minutes. I don't know. I just picked a number. Well, but it's, 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 I was just thinking about our safe routes to school and. Yeah. I, I think we, if we wanted to achieve that, we might have to do some more. I, I don't know that we could create a zone that that has that requirement. I think we might have to choose areas <laughs> that would be employment to create that network. I think that would be like identifying neighborhood nodes. Mm -hmm. But I think we'd have to go and say, well, we'll have a node here and here and here, and that gives us 10 minutes to, to all the different residential areas. Because then, it, it, under what you're saying, the, the employment would have to be everywhere before things were developed in new areas. And so that could lead to kind of a complicated, you know, chicken and egg scenario for development. Oh, I was just wondering from large landowners if that's that's in the zoning. So you pick a certain land size and say, as you consider this, you have to know that RS1 zoning requires all residents to be within a 10 minute walk of the commercial. And so in effect, you are doing sub area planning, but without um, that timeline in a small way. I mean, you still have to do it. I'm not trying to say we don't need to do that work in the first one. I'm just trying to find creative ways to um, make those adjustments in the short term while we do so very yeah. That's all. Yeah, I don't know the answer to that one, and it would, it would require some consideration. Uh, I have a Ted, Jason, and Susan. Like, you want us to... Yeah, good. Um, We're here to prioritize. Yeah. Yes, it's high. Yeah. 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 I like the pause. I'd like to find the few areas that are in the planning department's mind like this where we may miss opportunities to have a nicer neighborhood because we're not addressing them and pause them so that we can address them. Um, you know, for me in this area, it's mostly trail networks and habitat that I think, and, and actually agricultural, but, but mostly trail networks because if you're at the back end of this and you want to go to the civic centers, and it could have a very nice little neighborhood windy kind of trail through, and, and I just think we're missing that if we don't. Uh, do the neighborhood plans and so pause till we can get a neighborhood plan. And I think for me, Ted hits on like the mix of housing and stuff. We can we can work on that. But Ted hits on a really important point. We see it in Dentville with these big lots and just you know they're just building on this lot. There's no continuity between the areas. We're seeing it in um, um, North Yards with the breeze and the one beside it, there's no continuity. So in Brackendale with the single family home development, there's no continuity with the next door, next the neighboring big lots. We can see it in this area for sure with all these two acre lots. So how to connect from a trail point, particularly from a walking pedestrian point of view, I think for me that we have to somehow get that in there as soon as possible before these areas come back with 10 separate development applications for all the little pieces without any comprehensive connectivity. The mix of housing and that type of thing I think will come as we develop missing middle policies and blah blah blah. But so I just I don't know, I just didn't want to lose sight of what Ted was saying that how do we make sure all these neighborhoods with these bigger lots that are being zoned RM one, two or even R S three to connect. Thanks Ted. Jason. Yeah my remark uh specifically related to the RS1 shown on this portion of the map as well as the Crumpet Woods is that clearly, especially given the size of the Crumpet Woods lot, um, you're going to want 
I'm pretty sure we're going to want um, some sort of connectivity to the north because if we have all of that filtering out through Valley Cliff, that could be very problematic. And then also the active transportation that everybody else was mentioning. And then the only other thing though I would think about as far as RL1, and maybe council needs to consider this in the community, is that you know there may be an argument for the existing RL1 to maybe we say that we are going to keep it as RL1 and we're not going to entertain zoning because there is some utility in some of that zoning. It allows for flexibility for uses that really are hard to place in any other part of the community. So, you know, recognizing, of course, our desire to intensify development within our existing footprint, you know, maybe we can carve that one out and just say, and then also be very clear about it so that there is no speculation on these properties and landowners aren't acquiring them with the expectation to put up condos or whatever else. Um, you know, that's also something to be considered and I think would be part of the whole conversation. So I, I, I support these as very high priority areas to, to, to have. Yeah. Uh, Susan, and then we'll try to move on. Mm -hmm. uh, my only question is really about the, uh, yeah, moving on, and there's a ton in here. We're getting stuck in this one little neighborhood on this entire zoning bylaw. Um, and my only comment, and it may be about all of these zoning bylaws, is if we are no longer desiring single-family homes, and if that's, if that's some sort of decision we came to, uh, that there's going to be no single-family homes, and that we're going to prevent zoning of single-family homes. And what if, in the neighborhood plan, that neighborhood comes back and says, no, we want single-family homes. That's right now what I'm hearing, and what, regardless of how I feel about it, if the public in that neighborhood wants single families at homes and the public in the neighborhood in general, this sounds like we're telling them this is going to go in your neighborhood, do you like it? And that is not going to go over well. And that's generally the opposition we've been getting is instead of going out to the public and asking, we have this large discussion, decide what we want, and then go to the public. We need to do it the other way around. Well, at this point, we're not even supposed to be discussing what we want. Right. We're just discussing that we want something done. Okay, can I move? Uh, so, so I just, I just wanted. I saw Jonas put his hand up quickly. Yeah, and no, I don't think we're saying no to single family homes. No, not, not at all. We're just, we she do have policies in our current OSP, and we will have in the new OSP that talk about diversity of housing in the neighborhoods. Um, so in this case, this would be, uh, you know, a single family neighborhood. Uh, and I think, if anything, we're looking for something more than just a okay. single family. A diversity, not saying that this should go all condos or townhouses. Okay, Thank you. And, and I think that's where the conversation Ken was bringing in, like, can missing middle policies help to inform that so we get diversity of housing? In, in that some form, cases, in, yeah, in, in some cases they can, and I think, yeah. but it's also important to consider the employment opportunities um, and other things yeah, like exactly. trail connectivity. Yeah, absolutely. Susan, you want to Yeah. Um, so with single family homes and layaway homes, you know, I look on my lot where I have a senior living in the front house that we've accommodated by using Airbnb in the back so that we can accommodate a multitude of seniors in the front. So single family homes, we tend to think of them as one use, but they can be multiple uses and they can have, they can have a lot of dense <coughs> uh, and you can have employment in the neighborhood. I was just in Ten Tennessee, they allow you to use the front of your house as a commercial business. So there's all these really tiny homes with residences in the back and commercial spaces, and it fits perfectly in neighborhoods. It's really interesting just to see differences. Um, is it possible? Yeah, we're going to move on. Move on. Yeah, I, I, interestingly I enough, Matt and I were in, in a session yesterday, and you grew up in Toronto. There's this in Vancouver, you see it a lot where you just have a neighborhood and then there's a house, and downstairs is the variety store, or the convenience store, and upstairs is an apartment. It happens all over the place, and we don't have any allowance of that type of zone. It actually came up in a session that Matt and I were in yesterday. <coughs> how do we encourage, and it's particularly for a sort of the neighborhood convenience store or a neighborhood coffee shop or a small little restaurant or something, um, and that type of thing. So it, it was an interesting conversation we had. But how do you facilitate that? Um, but so we're we're getting in the <coughs> again. So I think generally it sounds like 
Council wants to create the alignment with the OCPs, but there's a ton of work in that. There's a ton of work in that. And essentially, essentially, you're saying sub-area plans. But in the meantime, if we can make sure that in every neighborhood we figure out connectivity, even if we haven't figured out the entire sub-area plan, that we make sure where every decision has the connectivity in mind. And I don't know if we just <coughs> connectivity plans in all these areas first, just to get that baseline there and not get too bogged down. I'm sort of throwing out ideas for the council to think about. But that seems to be the big thing, issue that comes up in those very prominent. Matt? And, and perhaps in that alignment with OCP, we can spend some time figuring out what uh, what is, needs to be done right now versus what maybe would take longer to do and, and try and parse that out. And we haven't done that at this point because we haven't spent the time to, to sort through all of this and get that totally identified. But we could perhaps come back to, it, to the council and say, here are the things that we think need to be done now okay. to preserve some of those opportunities. I'm just going to go to Jason, and then we're going to go through this list a bit more quickly. Yeah. Just wanted to say one last thing that I think sometimes we overlook when we have these kinds of discussions is duplex zoning. Um, that is actually, I think, something that you know um, has a lot of benefits in terms of you know the comments that we get around single-family home zoning is that it's easier for smaller builders to be involved and, and you know kind of do a couple here and there. Duplex achieves some of those benefits <coughs> and would still allow for that as opposed to. Wanted us not to forget that, and we have an existing test case in Brackendale, which I think, in my opinion, works pretty well. Okay, um, so Miss and Middle, um, I, I think this is <coughs> based on past conversations, is something that Council wants us to get some policy and encouragement in zone. Um, everyone's, everyone's okay with that as a high priority? Yeah, uh, employment space, do you want to? Yeah, so there's a few items in there. Um, uh, one of them is uh, in our business park. One of the things we heard a bunch through the OCP process and uh, their, uh, you know, communication with the the community is that um, there are certain businesses that have a hard time finding places to go, and the business park hasn't uh, been great for accommodating some of those because the um, value of the land has been affected by commercialization of what is industrial areas. And so one of the ideas is, or one of the, the concepts is to go in there and to look at um, <laughs> finding areas of the business park that could be specified for Drew Light Industrial and remove the commercialized aspect that tends to make it harder for some of the dirtier, uh, messier businesses that um, can't, uh, yeah, have trouble finding spaces to, to work. Um, another one is um, looking and seeing if there's opportunities for incentivizing or mandating a higher proportion of commercial space in mixed-use developments that we've done a bunch of um, work on what to do with C4 and there's an interest in looking and seeing if there are opportunities in other parts of the community and other zones um, to increase uh, or requirements for commercial space. And then um, another one coming out of the OCP is clarifying and differentiating light industrial, medium industrial and heavy industrial and ensuring that the permitted uses reflect that on different zones reflect those different uses. So, oh, is this a priority for council? Yes. I have Ted, Jason, too. I, I'm basically okay. I, just, I do have a question about, like, we're incentivizing all this office, you know, in the residential developments, and I don't want to see the day come where all of a sudden we have all this empty office space because we've been incentivizing office and the builders are building it reluctantly now. And I know that we did all our numbers on how much we need, but I think we should have some quick little review of how we determined how much commercial space required in our town because uh, you know, being a town that commutes, I don't know if it was really thoroughly looked at. So I just, I just have a little bit of a worry when I see all these developments going in, particularly in the downtown with all the second floor offices going in and the ground floor offices and I'm going like, I just want to pay attention to that. Jason. Uh, I agree with the intentions of, of this idea, but I'm, I'm questioning whether or not it might be too late for us to be doing that with the business park. Um, and given that it is a fairly small area, um, I mean, I, I would maybe try and condense it more into um, looking at retail and really climbing down on that. But commercial, like when we're talking about like, um, you know, uh, a brew pub with uh, 
on-site production and stuff like that. Like, yeah, like I don't really think we should try and restrict that. I'm wondering if there might be other other lands within the district that might be suitable for these these other sort of industrial uses that maybe we could move on a little bit. I don't know if there's. I mean, obviously in the Chikai Fan, there's there's some issues there and whatever, but. It, you know, we have had some discussion about, well, is there, depending on the intensity of the use, maybe there is availability of lands there for certain types of activities or um, in other areas. I just, I'm concerned that, I don't know, I mean, if we really get down to the parcel level, like, that's practically what we would almost be doing, and that might not be very good, given the fact that um, it's already hard enough to put a lot of these uses, you know, like whether it's like a oil and lube shop or something like that. We saw how difficult that was when it went into like sort of a non-business park area. So I'm just wondering what the impact would be. I'm a little bit more cooler on this this particular. And it's priority. and it's got lots of different things in there too. Like it's industri late industrial. It's the mixed use developments that Ted was talking about. It's a it's a big it's a big area. There's lots of stuff in that. Uh, um, Susan and Doug. Thanks. Yeah, I would agree with Jason on this. I, restricting employment, you have to let employment happen how it's happening. And the employment that, we're, that is the employment that we're getting is commercial use. We're getting craft beverage. Just, uh, I think that the, the problem is, is that the buildings that are going up in that area don't allow for anything else. You're basically having pop-up cement buildings on cheap on land that was bought relatively cheaply cheaply for the market. Not many people need space like that, uh, so it's the stuff that we zoned and allowed to be built attracted that sort of use, and it's made a great economy of craft beverages in that area. There's 13 in one year, and that's incredible. So, uh, but in the meantime, small businesses can't heat double-decker. You know, you want to encourage small business and medium-sized business, so it's hoping for a large industrial use. I don't know if that's, I know that we need industrial land. We've, I think it would be better to work out deals with BC Rail properties to keep large industrial use and let the business park grow. We're, we're putting residential next to it. Uh, and I think that when you're in those sort of areas, you have to expect, you know, I don't mind like oil loops shops going in or mechanic shops going in. And I don't think the, I think the land is affected just because of everything else that's going on. It's not really because of the employment that's going in there. But when the employment land becomes desirable, the price goes up like everything else. It's not uh, it's not pure industrial dirty land anymore. And in Vancouver, there's there so those sort of shops all the way through their industrial area is co-working spaces, breweries, and industrial use all together, and theaters. And like it's amazing how people work together when the zoning's opened up for to allow employment. So I think easy. with staff, I, th I think, so what, and I've still got Doug and Karen on the list here, but um, on this one, it sounds like it's something that's of interest to people. And we want to figure out how to find it. We want to minimize retail. We want to actually facilitate some of the stuff Susan was talking about. And currently, our zoning's problematic in that area. So. Yeah. So, it, uh, so it, I think it sounds like we want to do something here. We just have to actually define it. <laughs> uh, I, I also do think there's an important piece to actually making sure that we're not minimizing the opportunity for those medium to heavy industrial uses, and we got to figure out where those can be and, and how they integrate with the rest of the business park slash uh, Doug, then Karen. Yeah, I did. <clears throat> We had a discussion about this one night in council about, and I can't remember what the issue was, but um, but I remember making the comment that maybe we should try and move sort of a, the light industrial down to the south end and have the north end more of the commercial because it's closer to residential. And I don't think anybody agreed with me, but but um, so I'm not. I tend to agree with Jason at this point. You know, a lot of the cat is out of the bag uh, with respect to this commercial light industrial and and. Uh, uh, I think we can just sort of accept that. The one that jumps out of me is this medium industrial. Uh, and the first time I saw that used was in the employment land strategy. Uh, and it applies to just a description, but we don't really have a zone for that. Um, and I think that might be helpful. Um, 
to pick areas which are probably not within, uh, or at least not uh, not to the east of Queensway, um, that might be considered as medium industrial. In other words, could accommodate a more um, uh, noisier or something business, more traffic, more sort of a not light industrial, not the light commercial use. Uh, and over in the BC Rail Lands uh, is an obvious spot for it where you've got small sawmills and things like that and, and possibly up in the airport area. But to define that, and, and then I guess the other question that popped into my mind is in taxation. There's a category for light industrial, there's a category for heavy industrial, and there's no category for medium industrial. Um, for assessments, um, if we had a medium industrial category, I guess as a BC assessment would decide whether it goes into class, whatever it is, four or six or whichever yes. one or two, yep. they would just allocate it. But our zoning uh, would location, set the location sort of things. And I think that for me is more of a priority uh, because I think the business park is kind of going the way, uh, you know, we created mud zones as transitions and stuff like that. And I think it's sort of resolving itself, but there are some big pieces of property on the other side of Queensway, uh, backing onto the tracks, uh, which might be more suitable for something that's um, kind of a medium industrial type, like the stoneworks through there and so forth. So that to me is more the priority because a lot of those are, are basically undeveloped. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, I was gonna say the three things in that box the priority for me in the short term is the third one, which is to clarify and differentiate the light, medium, and heavy. Um, I, I too think that east of Queensway near the tracks is a place to re reserve for heavier in industry. West. Thank you. Yeah. Um, that medium industry. Yeah, that medium. Um, and I actually think it wouldn't hurt to, to protect some of that area's light industrial if non-commercial because I think that would help keep prices lower and allow certain types of businesses to use in there that might not otherwise. I think with the mud zones and the fact the way that the northern part of the business park is developing creates a lot of different opportunities for a mixed use of commercial and, and light industrial, but you know, I think there's an opportunity to anyway to find those better and maybe look at protecting some of that land. Non-commercial uses. So my priority is the third. Just one thing on that topic. The um, I think one of the issues that has driven some of these problems in the commercial in the business park and, and this item being in the list is that our light industrial zone does have a lot of commercial aspects to it. And so um, I think what I'm hearing from council is that there's you know this is allowing a mix of uses to occur in these areas, and that that can be really good. But one thing I think from a planning perspective is we do want to hang on to somewhere for those actual light industrial uses that are um, maybe messy, don't have as much of a commercial aspect. And because we don't have a zone that is specific to them, a lot of the zones are becoming more expensive and aren't. we don't have homes. We continually hear from light industrial users, there's nowhere for me to go. And so this is the idea here is to actually make that zone you know, maybe the business park it, um, allows this mix of uses, craft beverages, all that. But we do need to find somewhere and hold it to that use so that these people have um, a place to run their businesses because they can't compete with the craft. Yeah. So I don't want to, I, I want to move on. So I think it sounds like we're not all on the same page about, but we do think that some clarity and, and make it sound like a bit of a sub area plan for the business <laughs> park. Um, but generally, I'm hearing there's interest. It may not uh, be as deep as what you've got here, but we want to do some clarification. And <coughs> is that fair enough, everybody? Yeah. Okay. Can we move on uh, new zones? Yeah. These are best, basically a bunch of zones that reflect some of our new land use designations that we want to apply. So lands that we want to conserve for conservation value, we'd like to have a zone to apply to that. I'm wondering if, uh, we'll have two sex. I'm wondering if um, one zone we want to contemplate is a rental accommodation zone. Sure based on some of the stuff that province is now allowing that we actually actually want to zone in Canada without having to cut into covenants and blah, blah, blah. Purpose built. Purpose built rent, not, not short term. Rent. No, okay. purpose built, yeah, exactly. long term. Rent. I don't think that's legislation yet. When it is, then. Yep. <laughs> you gotcha. That's it. Yeah, thanks. I'm just curious, when you talk about create a zone, are you talking about the text or are you talking about actually attaching it to a piece of land? 
uh, to create the text, the, the new zone, and to attach it to a piece of land. For example, there's um, resource zoning that's applied to a bunch of areas that um, are in our new our conservation land use designation, and so we're thinking it would be appropriate to have a, a zone that's based on conservation rather than resource use, which permits a fairly wide variety of uses. Yeah, I mean, I, I must admit, I focused on the marine zones, and, and we have a strategy underway right now, as you're aware, um, and I thought that it actually, the zoning is going to be for those specific parcels in the Blind Channel, for example, will be decided almost on a parcel by parcel basis as the developments of the upland lands, adjacent upland lands come along. Um, and we'd be able to kind of decide yes or no for each one of those zones. So uh, for me, it's a priority creating the text. Um, and I think the development, particularly in that area, uh, with those types of zones, will probably all of the upland lands as they come on uh, application by application. Um, and the only other comment I would add is just to include provision or criteria around um, liveaboards. And, and there are other examples where they are permitted, uh, not just houseboats, but also on boats, uh, and some of the requirements around that. Uh, Gravel Island, for example. Anyone else on Well, just to Doug's point, you know, if we don't have the conversation about these things and rely on a parcel coming forward and then saying no, because we haven't had the discussion about where the fuel dock is going to go or where um, the marina is going to go or where mixed use is going to go, I mean, I, I do think we need to have that discussion and pick those areas. Otherwise, development comes in and it's it's kind of like, where does the tower go? It's too late, it's already going. So anyway, so, so along those notes, you know, on the waterfront for sure, I think, I really do think, you know, it wouldn't have to be a huge discussion, but you know, at the road heads, for example, would be a good spot for something, and but just to get some kind of basic plan on that. And I think our marine strategy is missing that at this point, because we're not going to get that far into our marine strategy. Um, something else I thought it would be worthwhile council thinking about I was at a conference a couple weeks ago we were talking about um, the um, housing being a human right and how do we ensure that it doesn't matter if it's a social housing project or a homeless shelter or whatever that it's housing it should be allowed to go in residentially zoned areas and so simply make it an allowable use within residential zones, period, and, and take a more human rights approach to how, um, to those types of um, issues. And, and, and just to be very blunt, it would mean that those types of things wouldn't have to come for a rezoning in a residential neighborhood. It's housing, it meets the residential codes, it should be allowed. Currently, we, it's not a permissible use. So one council kind of could be a homeless shelter, it could be a group home, it could be, oh. um, it could be a, a rehab center, it could be, uh, it could be anything. As long as it, if it's housing, then it, and it's in a residential zone, it should be allowed. As opposed to disallowed, as that's how it currently zone does. And it basically says everyone, it, it takes a human rights approach. Everyone, everyone has a right to a home. We shouldn't be able to discriminate based on that right. Yes. Um, They've done a lot of work on this in Ontario. So yes. It's not quite it. BC's been active yet, but. And I think there are certain types of housing that are already protected by provincial legislation. So under the Community Care Facilities Act, you know, smaller group homes are, can happen anywhere where a single family home can happen. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'd be taking that approach and maybe expanding on it in its own model. And it's a big conversation, um, for sure. Um, but it's to destigmatize things. There's a whole bunch of interesting reasons why you don't want to do it. That well, <clears throat> but if you carry that along, uh, if somebody has a single family lot, that means they can move a trailer up. Um, so, for example, um, because that's housing, somebody's living there. So, uh, I think you know the purpose of zoning and one of our fundamental duties is to try to regulate land use. Uh, so that there is some order and not chaos, and I think you have to be careful when you draw that line. It would st if, you, if you're doing a multiple, like you're doing an apartment building, it has to go into our, 
M3 zoning or whatever it is. We still have to go into the same great zone. Well, you're talking about housing, and how do you define housing? Housing is where somebody lives. They might live in a trailer. They might live in a geodesic dome. They might live in something else. I mean, there's all kinds of different ways people can house themselves. It might even be just a pop-up tent in some of the yard. And so, you know, you have to be careful where you draw that line, I think. Uh, I can understand when you're talking about putting things like uh, we did for helping hands and so forth in an area. No, I agree with you. Um, you know, and we can have criteria around that. Uh, but I think you'd have to be careful where you extended that to. I'm just wondering, though, wouldn't it just be a matter of uh, uh, inserting it in the schedules for each of the, the different zones to say, you know, and you would have very specific, like, supportive housing, homeless shelter, um, whatever yeah. else, and that would still exclude things like, you know, movable trailers or, or other undesirable things. Like, I think that that's, I, I'm, I'm supportive of that, and then I would just be interested in knowing how um, municipalities in terms of, um, and even how the province intends to regulate these things so that there is, you know, some accountability around the operators so that there are mechanisms and standards that we may set even as a municipality vis-a-vis -vis staffing or supervision or whatever, right? Like, because we could say, well, supportive housing is when there is 24-7 staff support, you know, versus more independent living and we might have so I could see how it needs a bit of refinement to, to make sure but I think the point is is to not I think subject those types of housing arrangements to an existing like an additional hoop I guess uh, exactly. that is beyond what we would typically consider for um, neighborhood uh, or planning characteristics whether it's you know so density transportation mm -hmm. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify, you were talking about use, not form and character. Absolutely. So we would allow the use, but it would still have to conform to the character of the neighborhood. Or, the, or, or what's allowed, yeah. or, the, or the density. Like, so you couldn't put a mobile home on an RS1 lot. Because we're just well, talking about housing is a very broad word. Yeah, but I think, I, I I think, think for clarity, the mayor, you were talking about use, yes. not form and character. Yeah. Yeah, but you know, on that, if you were going to have a 12 room house with, you know, like a helping hands type thing or a senior's assisted living house, wouldn't you want it within 10 minutes of a commercial area? So when we start doing our neighborhood plans, then we can pick areas for that stuff. I mean, I agree that I mean, with the boarding house kind of thing, Boarding houses are going to be coming more used. And yeah, I think they're great in areas close to stores. I wouldn't want to see them way out in the middle of the hill. And uh, as far as the uh, trailers on the residential, I remember we discussed that, and you can have a trailer on a residential <coughs> as long as you take the wheels out from under it. It's a tiny home, and you're allowed right now. If it's, um, yeah, if it, if it can conform to the building code and has a foundation. Oh, yeah, oh, I see what you're saying there. Um, anyway, it, it, it just occurred to me that we may want to add language in the zoning bylaw to bring us down that um, It's not really a new zone, but it's new use to existing zone. Anything more on the new zone conversation? Yeah. To that point, is do we have tiny home designation yet anywhere? Is it possible that we could do an FCL exempt tiny home regulation where I know FCL, I know don't go into provincial regulations, I don't need to hear that again, but we need to have some sort of you know, uh, small home zoning that could be like a uh, layway home that conforms, or maybe it's under 100 square feet, or... Does, like, for example, does a modular home zoning, could you put a tiny, if you have modular home zoning, you put a tiny home community in on that? Um, yes, you could. Um, so we, may, we, we just need to modify our existing zoning to make sure we're adding that language for that use? We, we don't really have any limits on size anymore, or, you know, 
homes. So any lot that have a small home on it, um, DFCL is an issue uh, that we haven't dealt with yet. Um, so we don't have a zone that would allow um, tiny homes in, you know, below the flood construction level. Like if there was a zone that allowed, you know, I'm thinking about a downtown lot in particular, or like a smaller lot that could fit five or six small homes all together as a community. I mean, on Finch Drive, that's what was supposed to happen <coughs> because of FCL, we ended up with big homes, not the tiny homes that we imagined. If you wanted to do that in the downtown lot, just as an example, throwing it out there, have like four tiny homes on one lot and no FCL. And then you could have seniors within walking distance with a co-op. I mean, it, there's just so many more things that you could do with allowing tiny, smaller living dwellings on, on regular lots. They'd be connected to services, uh, and they wouldn't have to climb 5.75 meters in the air as a senior citizen. <laughs> so I just think about the seniors living downtown. I can't imagine them climbing the full construction levels. Um, and so we haven't dealt with that yet. It's it's still that's still probably the major issue in Squamish for for tiny homes. Yeah. Um, it's something that we can look at um, as part of this process, but it. Um, I just don't have enough information to, yeah, can we to see tell you the, whether it's an I'd like to know if there's an exemption for that, if we can have a, a specific zoning for tiny homes. I know the community is interested in that. Uh, and to, you know, if we could do an exemption from one type of housing and make it because of seniors housing. Yes, yes you can. You could do that through the flood bylaw. The difficulty that I, I understand it is a lot of these tiny homes don't need building code. That's the real you can zone for whatever you want. You can put the building permit on across the building code. Then. Well, you can make a building permit. So can, we can't. That's it. We can't do that. They're not dropping in. I'm talking about building something specific that's small on a lot that would be considered a tiny home. Under something yeah, that's 500 square feet. It's eminently possible. It's unlikely that that would get built on a lot that's that expensive. I'm thinking about the Portland Tiny Home Hotel right now in my head. Yeah. yeah. Downtown residential lot, 15 different tiny homes on it, used commercially, but didn't, doesn't have to be used commercially. I, 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 I'm going to paraphrase, but I think Council would like to see a way of at least allowing tiny homes in the municipality. People want to not spend that much on a council lot, that's a them. And we have a factory yeah. that builds them. Uh, Doug and Karen. Yeah, um, and I don't completely disagree with that, but I think um, it would be irresponsible to try to avoid uh, the FCL issues um, and put people at risk uh, for that. Um, so I'd be very careful about that. But there are, having said that, there are areas in the community um, that are above the FCL and could accommodate something like that. Uh, once again, when you do something like that, it's a little difficult sometimes to re-engineer a neighborhood for that kind of thing, but I'm thinking of places that haven't quite developed yet, like the Chikai Fans and some of the other um, areas where you can think about that going into it. To me, it's, it's practically the same issues as a mobile home park. Uh, it's just a tiny home instead of a mobile home, but you still have to accommodate services, parking, uh, etc., uh, and all the traffic considerations and so forth. So, um, but certainly to consider something like that, uh, if it could meet these other safety requirements, um, yeah, why not? Karen, um, I don't mind the intent of that, but if we're having a priorities discussion, it's not something I need to see done by the end of our term. I mean, when I look at Using middle housing and the secondary suites piece and all that sort of thing, I would prioritize those about the tiny home zone, which I think could come in the full zoning bylaw update, but it's, it's not a high priority in the short term. Um, Ted? Yeah, so I mean, you're already allowed to have a tiny home. Wait, we're not allowed to have this tiny lot, but I know that I think what Sue's referring to, and I've seen them in all sorts of you surf the internet looking at tiny homes. You can see a town that's picked an area and they've taken a single family house, maybe four of them in a row, and they've turned them into five little houses on each lot, and all the homeless are living in there, and they're getting back and they're getting jobs, and they're starting to feel human again. I mean, I've seen that, and yes, 
you know, to Doc's point, the Chikai Fan, if I remember right, has a whole part of that subdivision is tiny homes. Yeah, which is, like you said, it's a trigger part. Just take the wheels out. Um, I don't know who wants to buy a $700,000 downtown lot, but five tiny homes on it, but, you know, so we, we are allowed tiny homes. I, I don't think that's a priority by the end of the term, because I think if people want to do that, they could, could and they could be encouraged, like on the bigger developments, but they're encouraged. I wasn't thinking about tiny home zoning. I was uh, just thinking about expanding our missing middle zoning to include tiny homes. And if we have an entire neighborhood of, uh, there's no reason why one lot can be all, can be all tiny, tiny homes in a missing middle zoning. It's not a separate zoning, it's just opening up the zoning to allow different housing forms. Yeah. And the economics of it are actually really good. Tiny home hotel, Texas, Leon's Austin, Portland. Yeah, and we we do have modular home RS ten or something. I can't remember what it is. I actually think the one on Finch is on that. It's not so RS one. RMH one. RMH one or ten or something like that. But it's it's essentially modular home, which is ironic because there's nothing else on it. But um, anyway, so we do have zoning that sort of allows it. But I think we're looking for more enabling language, and maybe there's piece in the missing middle that addresses tiny homes in a simple way as a like get it done simply and then maybe it, it's more comprehensive down the road but everyone okay with that um yeah, i just started with tiny homes university zoning okay um this one is a, a little more complicated because um some of the items within this area probably need to be uh preceded by an update to the separated plan for the, um, you, the Sea Sky University plan or the, the Quest University. Um, some of the things we would want to achieve there, uh, establish minimum residential neighborhood at the, or densities at the neighborhood level, zone specific areas for neighborhood commercial use. Uh, yeah, mo most importantly, include separate plan housing form proportions and zoning so that the separate plan has a specific proportion of single family and multifamily and we want to make sure that that's achieved. Um, I think we think this. I think this is long overdue. Anyone disagree that this university long summary overdue. claim is long overdue? Okay. okay. Waste uh, management. Waste management. Uh, the the biggest issue here is um, that trying to ensure that we have good solid waste collection areas. That the the, um, the bins that are um, used in some multifamily areas are considered a problem um, for wildlife attractant and. Uh, so there's a desire to make sure that we have multifamily solid waste collection areas. So and anybody disagree? Okay. Energy efficiency, there's a kind of a suite of items related to energy efficiency. So create density bonuses for residential energy efficient construction, permit vehicle charging and alternative and energy. You don't have to read it. Yeah, sure. Okay, <laughs> I, I think based on past council discussions, I think this is a priority. Okay. Um, flood hazard regulations. Uh, this is um, trying to uh, clean up some of the regulations that uh, and, and, and some of the unintended consequences that are happening with our, our um, flood hazard regulations um, and, and a, a bit of kind of twisting of the regulations. So we want to make sure that the, the secondary suites or the carriage homes that are built kind of match the intention. And um, there's, a, there's a bonus, a height bonus that's getting applied more broadly than it was intended. Um, the habitable area definition needs some tuning. Building has some challenges with that. So trying to tune that up and make sure we get um, what we're looking for. And also kind of managing the, the scale of the, the secondary suites. There have been some concerns about um, how some of the secondary suites that are getting built are fitting into neighborhoods. Absolutely. So is that to address some of the concerns that we've been getting on the guy next door? He's building the carriage house and now I've lost my privacy. Yes, um, there's some there's some issues with what what we're getting in terms of size and, and um, so address some of that, uh, but yeah, we there's there's always going to be implications on yeah. you know impacts to privacy when we have secondary suites, so it's not going to eliminate that, but try and address some. Can, can you explain the first sentence? Consider increasing garage exemption to 70 square meters for carriage houses, so the whole lower floor in the floodplain can be excluded. Uh, consider increasing garage exemption. 
it sounds like you're just trying to make bigger homes. Yeah. Um, now, let me think here. That one was. I think there may be some misalignment in terms of what is excluded from um, the the lower floor area in terms of what is it reflected in the upper floor. Um, so it's not. It's that this is not. Wouldn't be a substantive change. Um, but I don't think it's aiming at reducing the size of um, yeah, okay. secondary um, or occasions. Just didn't understand what it meant actually, so I was just curious. Yeah, I'd have to go. A lot of these are have been added by the entire staff as we go through, and I've looked up a number of them when I've gone through. But this one, I believe, it's because yeah, there's the there's um, the garages end up having to be smaller in the downstairs than the actual upstairs, and so it creates this kind of disconnect because of oh. how much of the garage we exempt from the GFA. I'd have to take a look at it again. So, I'm just trying to understand this too, and then I'll go to uh, Jason Karen. Um, 70 square meters is about 750 square foot footprint. Yeah. And so then you have ground level 750 some odd square feet, so I have to still think about <laughs> meters and feet. And then you have your second story, which would be about the same. You wouldn't have a third story necessarily, would you? Just two no. stories. No, the intention is not to be under a certain height. Yes. But you're saying that the ground floor wouldn't be part of the equation for the for the FSR, I think. Um, the intention is that whatever we have permit on the on the top floor. In yeah. terms of our secondary suite size, that underneath that you can build a garage that matches that upper, so that you have, oh, okay. a, a, you know, your permitted secondary suite on the top floor, and then the bottom you've just got garage rather than having to do something funky to have less space in your garage or a smaller garage. Okay. Okay. And oh, so, so it's what the we limit. Use is what our footprint is allowed to be? Yeah, it's essentially to align the top and the bottom floor. Okay. Okay. Uh, Karen and Jason. Oh, no, um, I thought of all of them, this would be a really quick one to do at the end of our term. It wouldn't require a lot of consultation because it's just fixing inconsistencies. And I think it's important um, because I think we do want to allow increased density for people to put um, carriage homes, that sort of thing. Same with the secondary suites one that comes next is just cleaning some of that stuff up. So both of those are a high priority. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, on the last point, restrict permanent structures uh, in areas of Chikai Fan in certain areas. Which areas are we talking about? I think they'd be in the highest risk areas. That include the airport? Uh, I don't think that the, the <coughs> risk level comes down. I think the one and two is a higher. Like above the landfill. Yeah. And like on the other side of the uh, Lake, there's a couple of uh, commercial nodes on the highway, for example. That I think that's where you have yeah. to be. Yeah, we have this long-standing OCP policy that says there will be no buildings in these high uh, areas one and two or zones one and two. So I think we're just implementing that into the zoning bylaw. It's already something that's being implemented. And so then, how does that affect? Like, I'm still curious. I mean, one of the things that we've been talking about for the last, you know, four years is the um, the airport. And is, are we making changes to clarify that? Um, because as I understand it. Um, there is no permanent structure uh, allowed on, on airport lands. Is that true? Yeah, essentially. Yeah, because I don't know. I mean, for me, I mean, I don't know. I wonder if we could also, within that sort of same suite, have an option there around the airport. And the pitch that I would make for that is that, you know, Airport uses are not easily transportable to any other areas in the district, and I know that it's something that the has been uh, requested uh, in the past by some of the operators there, and I'm just wondering if there might be a way for us just to take a look at that and have some options. Obviously, the council would have to agree with that, but um, I just think it might be time for us to really, you know, start start dealing with that because in my view it's just it's really you can't put you can't put anywhere else in the district it'd be fine if there was other alternatives um but i need to look at how that would work in, for, in terms of a you know 
liability perspective and you know how big the appropriate I know that's very detailed. Yeah. Maybe, maybe but clarify, just getting to that point. Maybe clarify because I think maybe I'm wrong. The airport they could do something, but they have to do it their own geotechnical and, and mitigation individually. Yeah, I think that is So it's not simply they just can't build, it's just it's too costly for them to build because exactly right. they have to actually and, and subdivision too, but they actually have actually have to uh, do their own mitigation on their own property or on their own lease, something like that. Yes, it, it is complicated in that area. I think we can certainly look into that as part of this process. Um, and like most of these, uh, you know, these are just one-liners. It'll be we'll have to dive in much more into detail when it comes to the actual process of updating the zone about. So that is a really good point. I know we have more information now about what's in the airport than what we used to have. Um, and so maybe there, there is an opportunity to have another look at what's allowed. I, th I think we have some updated language in the OCP um, based on, that we've, we've had meetings internally about you know, what can we do on the airport and try to take it as far as um, was appropriate given the, we, and we've had specific qualified uh, professional opinions on what can be done there. And so I think we've taken the policy in the OCP um, as far as we were comfortable at that point as staff um, think appropriate, so that we could bring it forward some information. Maybe, maybe about it that. just needs, first step is aligned with the OCP, second step is in the absence of a mitigation structure, what could we do if you okay. um, Doug, Ted, I can't remember if I saw you or not, but I guess it's okay. Yeah, that was close to my point because um, at the Com Dev Committee meeting, I think um, there was going to be. Uh, an application of carbon engineering. We didn't get into it because there's a, an issue with the OCP that we're currently in the middle of. Uh, but I think it's it's not specifically zoning, I don't think, uh, if I understand it correctly. But it is policy around what might be uh, constructed out of the Chikai fan absent some mitigation structure uh, like today. And um, whether um, there are some areas that existing studies have identified as not subject to flows. In other words, they're white on the map instead of color. Um, and the other is, is whether we want to draw a distinction between residential and industrial or commercial. Um, in other things that I've been familiar with, there's always been a distinction about uses here where people aren't living overnight, kind of they're sleeping overnight versus, and it's just there's a variety of different examples of that. So. Um, I think we, we couldn't go into it the last time because there's an issue with tonight's meeting, really. Um, but for me, that's a priority uh, to identify that. It's not strictly, I guess, a zoning bylaw amendment, but it certainly is a priority to try to come to grips with that, which I think will solve some anyone, of the questions we've had around Anyone that. disagree with that? Well, only because uh, well, I've, I've got my hand up to speak. So, uh, Go ahead. Give your um, you know, mm -hmm. until the Chikai fan berm is determined around the airport, I mean, it's been looked at ten times. Nobody's going to do anything. You can't get insurance. You can't do anything until we adopt a document that says that that berm is going to do what it does. Absolutely mm -hmm. correct. Is it? Well, um, no, we are. That item, the carbon engineering item, is coming back next week, I believe, on the on the agenda. So maybe that will shed a little more light on um, the info, like the, the the level of information that we have on the hazard. Um, and that's always that's always been a, a bit of a gap. Um, you know, our mapping for hazard hazard mapping is outdated. There's some new mapping around, but it's sort of draft. So we're I think there may be an opportunity in the near future to get more information on the hazard. So I, 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 it sounds like council generally wants to figure this out um, without prejudging the Chica Fan development and the green burn barrier. And now that we have more information, we can get there. So let's hold that off until next week. Uh, so, so without, uh, so I agree with uh, Doug's assessment of having consent commercial in any area from those hazard zones. We do it in the downtown for flood hazard areas. We allow commercial on the ground floor without flood construction level. And uh, I think in terms of uh, all the comments the council has made, I'm in, in agreement with, but we also have the opportunity to apply long-term leasing. We've only been doing short-term leasing at the airport, and there is no place to put it. 
So we need to have a long-term lease so they can get financing to actually do things. Is there a reason? Maybe that would be Okay. I'd like yeah, to hear and, and and let, Can we hold off on that conversation? We're going to see the Chikai fan thing next week. We can talk a little bit about them, about just cognizant of time and how much work the agenda we have to go through. And then staff need to take everything and bring it over to the 55, so we don't have an extended amount of time today. That's what I'm saying. Um, but I don't. We won't lose sight of that because it sounds yeah, like it's of high interest to council. So, um, and we were on secondary suites. Um, I don't know how we got on. <laughs> Airport. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, <laughs> that's okay. Um, <laughs> secondary suites. Anything else on secondary suites? Oh, just one thing. Yep. Um, it's required garages below secondary suites to include vehicle access. Um, I was in someone's secondary suite just the other day, and they didn't have a carport in there, and I, I didn't realize that you couldn't have a carport. But what they did have in there was their home office in the basement. It worked really well. Yep, no. So, so that's a question. So currently we have a size limit for, for secondary suites, and what does sometimes happen is that the ground floor, which is intended to be a garage, um, then gets converted to space and it doubles the size of the secondary suite. And so, you know, Ted it, knows nothing about that. Nothing about that. <laughs> so, um, so, so the question, you know, if if council wants to hold that that size limit for secondary suites, then the intention of this um, <coughs> item is to make sure that, at the very least, that um, there is a door and an access for a car to go into that that lower area of the structure that is supposed to be a carriage house. Um, you know, it's a different question if we're, you know, we want to extend the size of secondary suites and carriage houses could be larger. That that would be a different item. This one we're just trying to say, hey, right now we're seeing that these carriage houses are supposed to have um, garages in the bottom and, you know, it, it, there isn't a requirement that actually a car could get in there. So we want to say, well, at least the very least. I just thought that sometimes you want, you know, we talk about home-based businesses and <coughs> commercial in residential neighborhoods missing middle. Sometimes if the carriage house is on a corner facing out onto the road, the opportunity for a little office in there or a hairdressing studio or yoga studio or, you know, as a home-based business, I, I thought it was really a good use as opposed to a proper. Can I just respond to that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and so if that's something that council is interested in, to increase the sizes of secondary suites, um, because that would then become habitable space. Um, or increase the range of uses that are permitted in those structures, then that's, something, yeah, then that's something that I we should talk about. Uh, I haven't heard, although I've got a list, so, but I haven't heard council say we want to make bigger carriage homes. We just want to have different uses potentially in the carriage homes. Right. Be able to consider that. Yeah. At least that's what I've heard so far. It might change. Um, That'd be really crazy because we don't allow bathrooms on the in the garages so that we do allow do we allow bathrooms on the ground floor now i don't know so below the, the flood construction, construction level. Level. Yeah, yeah. so it would have to be outside of the flood construction level in the secondary suite so all of downtown wouldn't be able to have any secondary use but it's interesting to think about whether you have a garage door or a regular door if you're going to allow that use it's another flood construction issue you're forcing people onto five meters of cement with useless space except for a car downstairs, and the lot may have adequate parking. So all your stuff's down there anyways because you can't live in the upstairs because it's too small. Okay. But like, why not? Toilets in the downstairs, everybody else doesn't, their flood construction. So I think council's interested in not just, not just having garages down below, and so it sounds like we'd like to come back with some considerations for some policy on that, and it could extend it to some of Jason and Karen. Uh, I'm going to respectfully disagree with that approach. I think that um, to me, um, you know, I want to be able to have this, we have this available in all of our residential zoning. And I think if we start really allowing a whole bunch of other things happening in it, that, that will cause a lot of unintended issues. And I, the number one thing though is that it will have a huge impact on the affordability which to me is actually the main priority for allowing secondary suites and carriage houses. And so keeping the square footage small is definitely a very specific way to keep that in that affordable range. So I, I like where I stuff is going. I, well, no, I think 
council was saying don't make the footprint bigger. Staff was saying we could consider making the footprint bigger. Well, well this is on the garage thing, though. Right? Yeah. Isn't that what we're talking about? Yes, yeah. sorry. Um, when I say bigger, I mean in the, currently the, the space, the interior space on the garage floor is not considered part of the secondary suite, right? It's, a, it's not part of that 70 mm -hmm. square meters. And if we start using it for other things like office, then we're going to talk about including that secondary suite then becomes double the size from 70 square to 140 square if that becomes habitable space. And garage is the non-habitable space that we allow on the, okay. on the floor. So this is so a much bigger conversation much bigger. we get done here. I don't care. Karen? I think that it should have access for a car. Whether people use it for a car is their business, but I believe to provide flexibility for all future owners and people living in there, there should be access for a car. I mean, heck, everyone in my strata has access for two cars, and most of them don't use it. Um, so, but but the, the concept is good. So I think it should have that, allow access for a car. So we're not deciding that. anything here. Yeah. Bylaws are going to come back for consideration. We can debate the crap out of them and decide where it goes. The one issue that um, I just realized it may not be on this list. It is, but it wasn't in high, but I was actually going to bring it up. It's oh, moving up. Okay. Well, yeah. I'll, I'll pass it on to you then. Do we, are we moving on from secondary suite? Uh, sure. Do you want on garbage on secondary suites? Uh, no, not garbage on secondary. Okay. Commercial. Is that it? Uh, well, why don't we go? It's, we passed it already. Oh, okay, yeah. So go ahead. So we passed. Uh, where is it? Waste management. Uh, yeah, in the waste management, we currently. Uh, I'm not sure if it's already in the bylaw, but uh, making sure that commercial owners have lockable space and recycling, for, like uh, that all commercial owners in all areas have an area for commercial estate, separated three units uh, to make sure that they, in, in any business licensing, that there is garbage included in that some of the so older buildings. Yeah, currently you just have a multi-room, multi-family, I should say. Yeah. But yeah, these, more, these, these office there. slash commercial spaces that are coming forward, there should be consideration There's of, of waste management, management in that as well. So, sorry, you're saying commercial should have a waste inside management. waste management area or just somewhere on the a property? A lawful waste management, somewhere on the property, it doesn't matter, yeah. as long as it's lawful, bear proof, waste management. Adequate. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let's move on. Yeah. Any more on secondary um, speeds? Yeah. Jonas? It just, it just um, okay. <laughs> I'm hearing from Gary and, and, uh, and I agree that um, this is probably enough for us to chew on. We have on. more work than we can do with it. What we've got through so far. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and we, and so we won't be able to get all this done by That's September. Something. This was the last high priority one, Gary, that yeah. our chair sure. meeting. Thank you. Um, council, anything on the remaining list that is of, that council is considered a, a high priority? And, yeah, it's been, I have one to add. Okay. I'm not in council. No. <laughs> I'll ask you second. Okay, thank you. Okay, yeah, go ahead, Matt. Um, council's thinking. In the initial cut here, um, Airbnb or, or um, short-term rental was lower down the list, but some staff review uh, identified that it should have been higher. Uh, and so that's one that I just wanted to highlight that should have probably been in the high priority list. Um, some kind of regulatory structure for... Anyone in council disagree? Okay. Um, the uh, prohibiting of uh, water sale commercial extraction, I mean, isn't that fairly straightforward? Yeah, that, that, that. I was going to go there. I was going to go there next. Are there any of these that are lower, moderate, that are just easy? Uh, quite a few. A lot of them are. are they, as they go down, they, they do get easier. Yeah, there are a bunch of them are easy, but there's so a lot. So if there's of them. easy language changes, I think we should just, you know, within reason, just consider doing them. Yeah. Um, it just the the volume of items um, is quite large, and so um, we can certainly choose ones that are easy. But to, to to if to get all of them done, even if they are easy, the even easy ones tend to take a fair bit of you know careful consideration to make sure you don't have ripple effects through the zoning bylaw. So we we can certainly do what we can, but it might not be easy. To get. We hear your qualifier. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I guess I'm wondering which of the high we could implement 
or pieces of the ones that are rated as high. Well, this was supposed to be a conversation about priorities. I don't think anyone disagreed with the ones that you ranked as high, but we still don't have anything about what we would like to see prior to the end of our term that's realistic. So what's realistic? Is, is getting all the high ones done realistic by October? I don't think so. Mm. Well, we could do, I think the best, now that we confirm that these are high priorities for council, we could go back, we have a little bit more information from you on the, some of the nuances. Um, we could go back and come back in the near future with here's the things that we can do by September. Or maybe, uh, Councillor, are any on the high that you consider not needing done by the end of this term? Jason? Energy efficiency. I think that, I mean, because we have already the new, the new step code and all that happening, so that might be something we could do. I mean, I'm not saying long time, but I don't know. Yeah, there, that. There's some of those things in there, like uh, electric vehicle charging, and that I think should be done sooner rather than later, but do we need the thermal energy systems? Maybe not. Um, and even the density bonus, like, I feel like that's a good policy, but maybe we can wait on that, too. Um, well, on the density bonusing one, but we're going to be requiring mom and multifamily to have a plug-in for everybody anyway. Yeah. So. And, and when the step code comes in, it takes care of some of these things anyway. Okay. I think that if there's anything in the high list that requires consultation, we're not going to get it done before September. Because once we head into summer, it's not really fair. We hear that all the time from citizens is that, you know, they didn't know about it or they couldn't be here because it was the summer. So what I'd be looking for is um, the things that, you know, many of these have multiple items on them. And things that, like wording changes, like committing vehicle charging and alternative any production and most and all those, that's that's up to us. That's a wording change. We can do it. So those are the kinds of things that I'd like to see done prior to September because we don't need to do a whole bunch of engagement. The ones like aligning to the OCP and suburb planning, creating new zones, anything university zoning, like anything like that that will require quite a bit of engagement, I don't think that that's really realistically on our plates. And if we if we try and do too much, all we do is delay those other higher priority ones. It just moves the timeline up because we're trying to break it into little chunks. So for me, it's like, what are the simple things that we can do, like a, one of our omnibus zoning updates that don't, doesn't take a lot of um, work, but hits some of our key things around secondary fees, active transportation, employment space, and missing middle so, that are in our strategic plan. Can we clarify? A statement that Karen say if 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 um, something takes some public consultation, can can we get some done in May June and September and bring it back in October? Like I'm just trying to understand if that's a, a correct statement that if it has public consultation, we won't get it done by October. Probably if it's a quite contentious item that requires. Consultation, it's unlike it's not likely possible. Of course, anything we do, we would do an open house and have opportunity for people to check in. So, but there, there are there's going to be a scale of um, how um, how much uh, challenge it will be, or um, how contentious things will be, and how easy it is to do. And so, we could, I think, as staff, we could pick the ones that are not too contentious require a low level of engagement, but provide us some wins in our priority areas, the, the identified priority areas, and bring those back to council and say, here's a set from okay. the These will priority. take more comprehensive public engagement. We likely will get them done. Here's some that might take a little bit of, we can possibly get them done. Okay, and you'll bring that sort of analysis back. We can bring that back, yeah. Um, Jason and Ted. Uh, I was just going to say, as far as the university zoning, I, I don't know, I wouldn't expect to do too much consultation on that, like, because to me, and that that zoning, like, that, that whole neighborhood plan is, it just needs to be sort of finished and re rejigged to fit the reality. Um, I mean, I don't, 
I don't know, because I am concerned that we're just going to get, I think, more so than even the other RS ones that we talked about. Those are the spots where we're most likely to have applications coming through immediately. And from what I've seen in the previous, uh, like previous applications that have come forward in that one, um, there was a lot to be desired as far as it wasn't really meeting the standards that we're already applying pretty much everywhere else in the community. So. I would pitch that we actually, you know, put that near the top, in my view, because I think that will have one of the biggest impacts. The university. Yeah. And, you know, we do know that the university is very, you know, intent on ramping things up on their, on their development and their partners, all that jazz. So I would pitch that that's probably one of the top ones. Yeah, I would agree that that would be the top one for me. The other one would be all the areas that you want to pause. All the moderate stuff, I don't see any of really the moderate stuff being, being you know, ground shaking. If we get to it, we do. If we don't, I mean, obviously we're not going to get to that list. You know, when you turn the page, well, you know, now we're really not going to get to it. And so, that a lot of that stuff's got to be the next bunch. But the university, I think, is something that's been going for a long time without council ever really having a look at it. I mean, I know in my seven years here, I've never looked at it. So, you know, in a, in a council setting and discussed it. And so. so it would be university and the pause areas. Then anything else on top of that. Susan. And so the commercial activities as well. Um, the outdoor storage in specified areas, I didn't really, I just didn't really understand that. Um, it's in moderate, but uh, you just went through an entire reason why personal services and everything should not be there in commercial services. And I agree with that in the business park as well. But all of these housekeeping commercial activities actually does the opposite. So I'd like just, if we're going to have a discussion about the business park, I'd like housekeeping commercial activities to be included in that discussion before anything moves forward. Because it has to be comprehensive. You can't just like go, okay, well, now somebody's complained about this, we have to include that now, but we're not going to include. So uh, if we're going to have a comprehensive business park plan, we can't be just adding single uses to the, to the zoning uh, without a full comprehensive discussion. Because it has, if you want to include me in the light industry, you can't include uh, personal services. Those are two completely opposing things that, uh, yeah, you can't have heavy mechanics next to that. Well, you can, but you're going to get complaints. <laughs> Just to clarify, that was in the commercial zones, but a lot of business parks, light industrial. Yeah, it's a different zone. In a broader range of commercial zone, you're permitting personal service staff to mention the broader range of commercial zones. Yeah, so commercial that, versus industrial. Yeah. Which is? There's commercial uses in industrial zones. Yeah. So they, I think they're just talking about commercial zones and related to what's good in there. But it, there's also business parks in there. Prohibitive door storage and stuff like that is a business park. I think all of those have to come with a comprehensive use of zoning. Yeah. Yeah. And I would like the health activity without saying it out loud to be a priority that should have been done. And I'm not going to say it out loud because I don't want flyers okay. from Ontario. That may be. Uh, <laughs> I thought that one was already done. Okay, I may need to look into that one. <laughs> Let me take a look. I thought we had done Which that one? like two years ago. Last Health. Oh, yeah. Um, the only other one, and maybe I need more clarification on it, is the open space one. Mm. Um, and. We've been, we've been tripped up by this one a lot, I feel, um, and um, we're not getting the open space in multifamily, for example. We're not getting those comprehensive play spaces for families within our end zones. And, um, so I, I feel like that open space one is, has tripped us up a bunch, and we should get that done. Okay. Hi. And I'm not sure that will take a massive amount of consultation. Um, yeah. It is one that may be quite uh, contentious with the development community because oh. it's obvious impact on, um, on you know, density. We need cost. to build livable, 
multifamily. Multifamily, and we're not. Not arguing against that, just saying that they're. Yeah, I'm, I'm okay with that okay. conversation we had with the bill. Yeah. Yep. And I think, like, when I say contentious, <laughs> I'm more worried about community contention than okay. people with a bottom line issue on their hands. Yes. Um, one other one, add parking requirements for child care facility it needs to be, uh, we want walkable child care facilities. So having requirements that are unachievable for child care facilities uh, is going to be a barrier for entry for child care. So if it's a parking space or two, I don't want to see every child care facility that has to go in asking for parking leniency because they are putting a child care facility that we've added eight spaces in residential use. Yeah, well, just 345. What? 315. It was supposed to okay, start. I'm going to suspend this meeting. That's three minutes fast, so I'm not worried. Okay. Um, <laughs> We're going to have open the special meeting and look for a motion to adopt the agenda. The special meeting moved by Jason, seconded by Ted. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. We're back in our committee at home. Um, just to that point, may I respond? I, it's just that um, child care facility isn't listed as a use at all in our parking requirements, so there is no parking requirements. And maybe we want low parking requirements, but it's just not addressed. Oh, okay. I don't want it to be a barrier. Of course. So, so I think um, we're looking for staff to come back with the ones that we've said hi, categorize them. These are going to take a lot of public consultation. We won't get them done. We don't want to rush them. We can get these done. They might take a little bit of public consultation, or this might take more, but it's really important to get done. And then these ones, actually fairly easy. And even the low and the moderate, if there's real easy ones that really are just corrections, that we include those ones as well. Is that fair enough? Yep. Is that fair enough, Council? Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Linda, did we want to go through this list? Yeah, um, Mayor Hanson, um, if you look at your printout, and I'm not going to pull it up on the screen because I understand IT is coming. I'm sure they would take the laptop. Um, based on our conversation or the conversation with council last time we talked about priorities, what I've done is taken the list that council provided and put them at the top. So there are seven um, priorities that council absolutely wants to see done by um, the end of the term. Now that doesn't mean to say that things below will not get completed. They're just what this does do is obviously help us focus as time goes on and if the scope of things changes. Um, the zoning bylaw, obviously, number one, is what we were just discussing with staff. The staff will come back with a further refinement of what council discussed today. Um, and then there's the, the following six. I don't know if you want me to go into them in detail, or really just looking for confirmation from council that I captured what we discussed last time. Any disagreement, council? So it, we, everything's being worked on. We're just making sure we get these things done by the end of the term. Um, I, I was thinking about this on the weekend. Um, actually, I'm not going to bring that up. It will be a big distraction. We'll Everyone okay with that? Karen? Um, I know we budgeted for an evacuation plan. And I'm just wondering which there's the, it's not the wildfire protection plan. Mm -hmm. right. Multi-motor evacuation plan. Okay, so it is going to get done by the summer. Okay. Oh yeah. Okay, um, Susan. So we're just said uh, uh, food vending is a uh, higher priority for you this summer and today. Location for portable food vending. I think that's all. Oh, that we're, we're past that list. Um, they're going to come back with, if, if it's low on the, if it's low on this list. Yeah, yeah, no, I think um, the easy low stuff, they're going to bring back as a consideration okay. in the, something considered for the end of the term. Um, okay, um, we're done. Motion to terminate the meeting. Moved by Jason, seconded by. Ted, all those in favor, opposed, motion carries.